Um, so first of all, thanks the organizers for um, inviting me and the opportunity to give a talk. Um, I also want to thank uh, one other person in this room, and I want to thank um, Tom Seyfried in particular. So if it wasn't for Tom and his work and his persistence in pushing forward the agenda on the ketogenic diet, I, I wouldn't be here talking about it because it really was that breadth of data um, and the excellence of the data that he put forward over the last decade that um, sparked my interest and got me wanting to think about this and work in this area. So I'm going to talk about the ketogenic diet and cancer stem cells. And everyone here is probably very familiar about the ketogenic diet, but maybe not so much about cancer stem cells. So I, I, I need to educate you a little bit about cancer stem cells, but if you want to talk about cancer stem cells, you actually need to talk about normal stem cells first. So you actually have to go back, talk a little bit about normal stem cells, and then we can talk about cancer stem cells, and then we can talk about targeting them. So <clears throat> we define stem cells, somatic stem cells, adult stem cells, primarily based on what they do. It's kind of interesting. We, we identify most cells based on what they look like. So they may have an antigen profile. There may be an antibody that binds to it. But we define stem cells in the adult mammalian body based on what they do. And so another way of putting it is a stem cell is actually a verb. It's not a noun. We think of it as a noun, but it's actually a verb of how we define it. And so what does a stem cell do that defines it? Well, one, it proliferates. That's obvious. Number two, it exhibits self-renewal. And what I mean by this is when a stem cell divides and makes two cells, at least one of those two cells will be another stem cell. So it has a choice. I can divide asymmetrically, where I make one stem cell and one non-stem cell, or I can divide symmetrically, where I make two stem cells, and hence I'm going to be increasing my numbers of stem cells. What a stem cell will never do to be defined as a stem cell is it will never divide and make two non-stem cells. Because if it does that, it's not exhibiting this key feature of self-renewal. It's, it's responsible for production of a large number of progeny. An example, your hematopoietic stem cell is responsible for producing billions of new cells every day in your blood system. The cell ultimately responsible for that is the stem cell. It doesn't do it directly. It actually divides asymmetrically, makes a stem cell, makes a transly amplifying cell. That cell goes on, divides like crazy, and produces your blood cells. When the blood cells start to run out, um, signals are sent back telling the stem cell, divide again. It is a multi-lineage differentiation potential. We won't touch on this because it doesn't really have much to do with the cancer stem cell hypothesis. And it regenerates tissue after injury. So when you bleed, um, you lose a bunch of cells. Um, the hematopoietic stem cells are really responsible for replenishing those cells. <clears throat> so now there's two other features that somatic stem cells, virtually all somatic stem cells exhibit. And these are actually really important for the cancer stem cell hypothesis. And what it is is one is they're rare. There's not a lot of them. So your hematopoietic stem cell is like a one in a 10 million cell, okay? You don't find many of them. And the other one, which is really important, is they tend to be slow cycling or infrequently cycling. In other words, they don't divide that often. And the reason this is going to be important for the cancer stem cell hypothesis is that if in tumors, if you do have a stem cell, a cancer stem cell, that has stem cell characteristics, this feature of being slow dividing and not dividing very often is actually going to be very important. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. <coughs> so what are cancer stem cells? And so the cancer stem cell hypothesis started you know, two decades ago, um, even though there was a lot of data earlier um, talking about this. But really, it came into our consciousness, our scientific consciousness within the last two decades. Last decade, there's been a lot of work done on it. I still think it's a hypothesis personally. But what the cancer stem cell hypothesis poses is that most cancers contain a population of cells that um, exhibit many of the key somatic stem cell properties. These are cancer stem cells or tumor stem cells. Number two, the cancer stem cells or the tumor stem cells are cells that initiate tumors and or are responsible for long-term propagation of the tumors. And number three, it's the somatic stem cell properties that if a cancer stem cell has, may make it resistant to conventional therapeutics. And fourth, if we can target these cancer stem cells, we'll get better outcomes. So when we look at these key stem cell characteristics I just talked about, and we say, do cancer stems, do, do we find these within cancers? Well, yeah, C cancers proliferate. They exhibit self-renewal re self over a long period of time because they proliferate forever, basically. Definitely production of a large number of progeny. This multi-lineage differentiation really isn't much of an issue for this. Um, and they regenerate tissue after injury. So, you know, you cut the tumor out, you irradiate it, it shrinks, it's just about all gone, and it basically regenerates the tissue, the tissue being the tumor in and of itself. 
But what about this issue of being rare and being slow dividing? And rare is another feature. There's probably, it's got to be several dozen research papers, not a hundred research papers, um, supporting the idea that the tumor initiating cells, the tumor propagating cells, aka the cancer stem cells, um, is a relatively rare population. And so here is an example. Here, this is a, um, this is from a colon cancer. This is where they identified the tumor initiating cell, the cancer stem cell base, because it expressed its antigen called CD133. They could take 3,000 of those CD133 cells and repopulate the tumor. And so you can see after about four weeks, tumor starts to grow and starts to grow like crazy. Now, if they took the CD133 negative cells, they had to implant 100,000 cells to get more or less the same sort of growth curve. And if they just took the tumor itself without separating out specific types of cells, and they implanted a million cells, didn't form a tumor whatsoever. So this supports the idea, and again, you know, there's probably a hundred papers out there, that it is a relatively rare population. And what about this issue of rarity? And so here's a uh, sort of a summary of a study we did a couple years ago, and we showed that within high-grade gliomas, there is a slow cycling cell, and that slow cycling cell is a tumor initiating and tumor propagating cell. And so what we did is we labeled cells with this dye called CFSE, and it's a dye that gets into the cells, can't get out. But every time the cell divides, the dye gets diluted in half. So we load cells up. We have one cancer cell, which then divides and it makes these clusters or these balls of cells that we call neurospheres. And that ball will have like 3,000 cells in it. Now remember, it came from one cell, one green cell. We then take those 3,000 cells, break them into a single cell suspension, put them through a fancy machine called a flow cytometer, and we can actually look at the, diff the, at the amount of dye that's in each cell. And we can identify cells that have undergone one or two divisions. So if these cells didn't divide very often, but yet it was ultimately the originating cell for giving rise to the 3,000 <coughs> cells that were there. And when we take this cell and we implant it into an animal, it forms this great big tumor. So when we go back again to our definition, are they rare? They fit that. Um, and are they slow cycling? Yes, they fit that part of the definition as well. So how do we study our cancer stem cells? And this is important because when I talk about how we, the evidence we have for targeting the cancer stem cell um, population, you kind of have to know how we study it and why we study it. So what we do is we get surgical samples d directly from the surgical suite of brain tumors. We put them in culture, and we culture them in a defined media. And this is a, an assay called the Neurosphere assay that we developed over 20 years ago. And they form these balls of cells. We can then break the balls of cells into a single cell suspension, replate them again, and they reform balls of cells again. And when you do this, we can propagate the cells you know, basically endlessly. We can pro propagate neural stem cells and cancer stem cells like that. But we can take this tissue from the brain, put it directly into a mouse. We can put it subcutaneously around the hip, or we can implant it directly into the brain. Or we can take this cell line we've generated from that patient, and we can implant it um, into the animal. And the other thing we do is though we also do a lot of tissue culture assays because we've developed assays for studying neural stem cells that allow us to quantitate the stem cell population. We can use those same assays to quantitate the cancer stem cell population. And in essence, what we do, again, is we start this cell line, they form these spheres, we break them into single cell suspension, and they reformulate spheres, and we just keep going around and around and around like this. And when we do that, we get these growth curves. And a few years ago, what we did is we developed a mathematical algorithm to bas basically mine the data that comes from this growth curve. And what we are able to determine are the numbers of symmetric cell divisions that the cancer stem cell undergoes. So remember, stem cell has a choice. Divide asymmetrically, make a stem cell, a non-stem cell, or divide symmetrically, make two stem cells. When it divides symmetrically, it's going to be increasing the numbers of stem cells or the numbers of cancer stem cells. And so we have a very simple mathematical algorithm that allows us to do that. And the other thing that we can do is then we can take these spheres, again, break them into a single cell suspension, plate them in an individual well at a certain density, and count the numbers of new spheres that come up. And this is called a clonogenic assay. And what it's saying is saying, how many clones within that population are there that can proliferate and make new clones? And so we can count the numbers of clones, but we can also count the size of the clones, because that gives us some data on the proliferative potential of each one of those clones, with each one of those clones being, a, in theory, a cancer stem cell. And so, again, I kind of touched on this, but I want to state it again, because it is kind of important when it comes to the cancer stem cell hypothesis, is that what it believes is that our current therapies, like radiation, chemotherapy, preferentially, 
target rapidly dividing cells. And so you may have a tumor, lots of rapidly dividing cells. You have this cancer stem cell that doesn't divide very much. You treat it with radiation and or chemotherapy. Those, rapid light, those rapidly dividing cells die. The cancer stem cell survives. The tumor comes back. If we can target the cancer stem cells, then when we get rid of those rapidly dividing cells and we have therapies that can do that, what will happen then is the tumor basically can't come back and we will hopefully get better outcomes. So what I want to talk about is a project that was started by a PhD student in the lab, Regina um, Marticello. Um, and Regina is now Dr. Marticello. She graduated um, a few months ago. And so this is when we started thinking about the ketogenic diet. And we wanted, again, really based on the work of Tom Seyfried. And But what Regina wanted to do is she wanted to develop a diet that had a little bit more flexibility and particularly with regards to the um, carbohydrates. So while well, the classic ketogenic diet is a 4 to 1 ratio of carbs to the other macronutrients, Regina wanted to develop something that was closer to 1 to 1. And so she developed a diet where the carbs are 10 to 20 percent of your total caloric intake. Uh, you take a medium chain triglyceride supplement. In her study, she used the Neo B895. And she called it a different name because she wanted to have her own name. So she called it the supplemental high fat, low carb diet. And so we started off with some tissue culture work. And the first question Regina asked says, what happens when you just change glucose levels and we use the assays that we use on the cell population that we study? And so we have here normal glucose. By normal glucose, this means normal tissue culture glucose, which is anywhere like 200 to 300 milligrams per deciliter. So like just super saturating. Physiological is around 100, 120, and low glucose is 60 to 80. And this would be the levels that you could get being on the ketogenic diet. So what she finds is that when she serially passes the cells, is that lowering the glucose level lowers the proliferation of that population, or the numbers of cells that we get out of that proliferation, uh, out of that population. And she's done this across multiple cell lines and gets that same effect. And then she asked, well, is it just proliferation or is there changes in cell death? And so she looked at two markers of proliferation, one called KI67, the other one called MCM2. Basically, these are proteins that are found in dividing cells. They're not found in cells that aren't dividing. And again, she kind of gets this dose-response type effect with regards to glucose levels. And then she looked to see, well, are more cells dying when you reduce the glucose? And she found, yeah, that was the case. And again, that's sort of a dose-response type effect that she would see. And then she looked at some of the assays that we've developed to look at the cancer stem cell population. And so one of this was the, at the clonalgenic assay. And so she found um, a reduction in the numbers of clones, so the numbers of cells that had enough proliferative potential to make a secondary sphere. She also found that the size of the spheres were reduced as well. So while there, in addition to there being less clones when you lower the glucose, the size or the proliferative potential of each clone is also substantially reduced. And then using the mathematical algorithm, um, she found that the um, lowering glucose levels from supersaturating to physiological to what we would call low glucose levels also is able to reduce the numbers of symmetric cell divisions that the cancer stem cell population undergoes. And so she continued on with her tissue culture studies, but now adding in this issue of elevated ketones. Um, so what she used was beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, she did a bunch of things, found an EC50, and she used the EC50 value of the 4 millimolar, which is a little bit high um, for what you'd see in humans, but again, it's within that ballpark of what you could get. And so she combined these treatments with the, um, um, with the ketones together with changes in the um, glucose levels. And again, she consistently found that when you added in the ketone treatment, she got a further reduction in the fold expansion um, of the tumor cells. And this was consistent across all three of the different glucose levels, with the best effect being being on low, low mm. glucose and with ketones. In essence, kind of mimicking in tissue culture the ketogenic diet. And again, she looked at the KI67. So are the cells proliferating less? And the answer is yes, the cells are proliferating less. But surprisingly, what she found was that adding in the ketones doesn't increase the amount of cell death. Reducing the glucose increased the cell death. Adding in the ketones did not. What the ketones did do is they did reduce the numbers of cells that were actually dividing. And again, repeating um, what she did before, she, when she looked at the sphere-forming assay or the clonogenic assay, she found the numbers of clones are reduced by adding the ketones. 
um, the average size of the clones is further reduced, and there's a further reduction on targeting those symmetrical divisions of the cancer stem cell population as well. So then she moved into the in vivo situation, and this set of experiments was initially done with a sub-Q tumor, so this is basically taking a million cells, put them into the hip of the animal, it forms this tumor, it's really easy to measure like every other day with some calipers of how the tumor is growing. And first thing she did is she looked at the blood levels of glucose and of ketones, and she found a significant reduction in glucose levels on the animals that were on her supplemented high-fat, low-carb diet, and it matched that of the, of, the ke of the classic ketogenic diet. And likewise, she saw significant increases in ketones, not as high as the ketogenic diet, but again, she did see a statistically significant increase. One of the nice things that she saw in her study was when animals were on the classic ketogenic diet, they lost weight and started to stabilize at about 20 days after being on the diet. Whereas the animals on the supplemental high-fat, low-carb diet, they lost a little bit of weight when they first went on it, not much, um, but then they continued to gain weight um, throughout the study. So they actually really liked the diet. And she looked at a whole bunch of other parameters of health of the animals as well and found that they were very healthy. So then, again, using this sub-Q model, she found that the tumor progression is significantly reduced when animals are on the supplemental high-fat or the ketogenic diet, and the results are virtually identical. And we just looked at sort of metrics like, you know, time to reach a certain size. This progression-free survival is saying, you know, if we look at a tumor, kind of thinking of in human terms of when you would define progression in it, um, she would see this uh, increase in time to progression of the tumor. And then she moved into the intracranial model. So this is where we take the tumor cells, we implant them into the brain, and we see how they grow. Now, we, it's difficult to, um, you know, at least we, we don't do a lot of imaging to be able to look at the day-to-day -day growth of it, but rather we just look at the end point of the animals. And so here's a control brain tumor. It's just massive. Like, it just takes up that whole, it takes up the whole brain. And here's what the tumor looks like. And these are just different stains. This is an ancient yeast stain. This is a human nestin because, remember, we're putting human cells into a mouse brain, and the human cells express this, um, um, this protein called nestin, and we, there's an antibody that just um, identifies human nestin. So it's a way for us to identify all the cells that we implanted and all the cells that proliferated from that implant. And you just look at the difference in the tumor size from a control to the animals on the, on the genus diet to the ones that are on the ketogenic diet. And we can quantitate this and look at what she called tumor occupancy and we see virtually the same effect whether you're on the ketogenic diet or the supplemental um, high-fat, low-carb diet. And then importantly, when we look at survival of the animals into the classic Kaplan-Meier curves, we find that the animals live um, almost twice as long as they do if they're not being treated. And again, um, the two diets were identical in our hands. So in summary, the supplemental high-fat, low-carb diet, um, or AKA the ketogenic diet, um, is able to target cancer stem cells. Um, it reduces proliferation, it increases cell death, it reduces the clonogenic frequency, reduces the size of the clones, and it reduces the symmetrical division rate of the cancer stem cells. And in vivo, it reduces tumor progression, and it also increases lifespan of the animals. And so one of the questions is then, is why is this important? And I, I think this has kind of been talked about a little bit, Maybe I don't know if anyone's presented this specific, this specific slide, but this is why it's important. So when you look at, so this is data in the United States from 1950 to the year 2005. This is 55 years. This is deaths per 100,000. Now when you look at heart disease, you look at stroke, you look at flu and pneumonia, it made a huge difference in a number of these diseases. And I think a lot of that can go to modern medicine. When you look at the difference in cancer, it's been dismal. 55 years, there's been a 5% reduction in deaths per 100,000 in the United States. Now, you know, it's 1970s when Nixon signed the Cancer Act. Um, the U.S. government alone, since that point in time, has spent um, around $90 billion on cancer research. I'm not talking the rest of the planet, all the biotech companies and all the money they've spent. We've probably spent well over $200 billion this is what we have to show for it. Now, admittedly, there are some success cases in here, but when you pool it all together, um, it's actually dismal. And so I, I'm always kind of remember, reminded of that quote that gets equated to Albert Einstein, although that is incorrect because he's not the person that said it. But the quote is, the definition of sanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 
I think, again, not being really a cancer researcher, because I'm more of a neural stem cell biologist, but when I come as a newbie into this field and I look what they're doing, I look what NIH funds, I look what people say about my grants, um, that quote just pops up all of the time. We have to do things differently. And I think the ketogenic approach, the metabolic approach, is one of those ways of doing things differently. So thank you. And so, so one of the things that we had done, so for instance, we, we know, and I think this community knows, that mTOR pathway is down-regulated um, on the ketogenic-like diet. And we see the same thing in the tumor cells. But, you know, all of these animals die, all the tumors reach endpoint. And when we look at the mTOR pathway, um, still down-regulated, but the tumors are just blowing. They're going like crazy. So yeah, they escape. And so the, the answer to that question comes from something we've been doing in the lab. We call it eco-oncology. And what we've been doing is we've actually were influenced by an ecologist at the University of Florida. One day we were talking about what our jobs are and we realized we actually have the same job. So he goes out into the field and looks at birth rates and death rates. And I look at birth rates and death rates in my tissue culture dish. He looks at the health of his population. I look at the health of my population, such as what pathways are being turned on. And he looks at predators. And I look at predators like chemotherapy and radiation. And what we come to a conclusion is that the ecologists have done a much better job at managing pest populations populations than the cancer biologists have done at managing their pest population. And there's a similarity here. So when you have a pest population, you have a billion pests running around in some defined space. You have the tumor the size of your thumb or your pinky, you have a billion cells in there running around in some sort of defined space. And so what we've been trying to do, and I know it's a bit of a long-winded way to get to how I wanted to answer your question, but what we're basically trying to do is say, look, can we act like an e ecologist? as an oncologist, and can I use your mindset? And so what the ecologists do to manage pest populations is they use a multiple sort of prong approach. So they'll use this thing, then they'll mm -hmm. use a little of this, then they'll use a little of this and a little of that. As the population adapts, they will adapt to that adaptation. And so the question for tumors, because they adapt, is the same sort of thing. As that tumor adapts to this one particular therapy, we have to respond to that adaptation by providing sort of another therapy. So I think there is an answer there, and I think the world of ecology actually has that answer for us oncologists. So have you, have you thought about the cost of this? Because the 5% decrease, and if you just actually calculate like how much it costs these days. Let me give you an example. The newest cancer drug costs a million dollars a year. If you compare it with the price of gold per grams, it's actually 4,000 times of the price of gold. And actually the patients will live four weeks longer, but it's not the therapy. It's practically because they have to be hospitalized because of the side effects. So when you, when you talk about success, uh, I would be very careful what's the clinical, economical, and medical implementation of that. Because truly, to, to my reading, these kind of statistics are kind of interesting, but, but, but when you add the cost, and also when you add, more importantly, how much pharmaceutical companies charge for these ineffective drugs, or maybe when they are effective, some of them, they are actually shooting for a 100% profit. For example, Gleebeck. To produce Gleebeck a year, supply costs about $1,600. They sell them for $120,000. And now, if you look at it, 99% of drugs fail, and when you start combining them, this adapting kind of treatment approach, how do you account for the, the price of all 
So I, I think you're speaking to the choir here. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely on the same page. Um, having had someone, a loved one, that went through all these cancer treatments and seeing the cost of it. Um, so when I'm talking about combining these treatments, I'm not talking about combining toxic therapeutic treatments. I'm actually talking about using non-toxic treatments. And so this is something my lab has been working on for a while. We've developed a polymolecular botanical drug which is basically another fancy way of saying this is a combination of some natural product extracts. And we found that it doubles the lifespan of animals that are also on the ketogenic diet. And so I think that general approach, and why we ended up doing that actually came from the ecology <coughs> world. Because, so the ecologists realized in the 1960s that applying toxic compounds was the worst thing you could do to a pest population. Because that pest population always came back worse. Um, you look at what the modus operandi is in cancer therapy. Take a co toxic compound, use it at maximum tolerable dose, and use it until failure. The ecologists learned in the 1950s, you don't do that because the pest population comes back and it's really bad. And so there's a thing called integrative pest management. It's basically the handbook. If you have a pest population, you pull the handbook out, you read it, you use that to guide. One of the guidance in there is to use non-toxic compounds. And so I think we need to take that same approach for the cancer therapies as well. Yes? So um, just to, I guess your work is to the client we talk about cost of pharmaceuticals, you brought it up, but it's very difficult to get a pharmaceutical on the market when you're fighting against the revenge of the C-class student and the FDA. Just <laughs> But back towards this particular uh, subject matter here, um, I was looking for markers of uh, stem cells, so did I miss it? Did you have any surface markers of these stem cells? No. No, no, because in general there are no surface markers for stem cells. So, you know, stem cells really are def is a verb, not a noun. And I think this creates a huge amount of confusion in the literature and why one group gets completely different results that another group gets because their definition is slightly different. Okay. So then what is the time to circulate the tumor cells in, in, in those stem cells? Um, that's a good question. So um, circulating... No, you know, there is not a lot of evidence that those circulating tumor cells are actually, quote, cancer stem cells. But you definitely do get circulating tumor cells that do come from the tumors. Um, that may be predictive of, you know, of some outcomes, but whether those are the actual, the actual, whether those are the actual cancer stem cells is debatable. That's one of the hottest diagnostic areas right now. Yeah. Thank you. And this last question, when you talk about your shift into your state, have you looked at glutamine metabolism? That's one of the major shifts that we see from where it goes to glutamine. Yeah. No, it's, it's one of the, we have not looked at that. Well, I would recommend that one. I think that's a great idea. Thank you.